Good afternoon. Uh, can you guys hear me? Can you see me okay? So today we're going to finish up talking about bearings. <coughs> Any questions before we get started? <clears throat> Thanks, Michael. Excellent. So I hope you guys had a good uh, break, and I hope you had uh, enough time to uh, work on the test and get some answers that you feel comfortable with and a process that you have some degree of confidence in. <clears throat> so yeah, are there any questions before we get started? So I'm just going to bring up the syllabus here. Um, okay, and just show you kind of where we are. We are actually like one class behind the updated syllabus. Okay, so here we are today, 12-2. Uh, your test is due today by midnight, I believe. We should have started on power screws and fasteners. Okay, so what we'll do is I'll try to finish up these uh, power screw and fastener lectures. I have uh, two lectures. Actually, I have a few lectures that I have already recorded um, on the channel, um, on the channel videos regarding this in the machine uh, design uh, playlist. So if you go to the machine design playlist, there's like 30 videos. And in here, uh, we have these lectures here on screws, bolts, and power screws. And this is a good lecture. Um, it's like the rest of my lectures, they're a little bit painfully slow because I'm writing while I'm talking. Um, which makes it... Um, a little bit frustrating for you I know um, I'm still working on the, the increasing the quality and clarity of this whole online experience um, but these are good lectures they use a different uh, terminology for the power screws I think a little bit different derivation so it's not the same so I'm going to try to upload slides that relate to the book uh, but you have these three lectures here on uh, bolt screws and power screws if you want to go ahead and watch some of that stuff also, uh, what we didn't get to in this class yet, but there's uh, decent content. Uh, here are the rivets welding and bonding. Okay, so this is, the, there will, there's questions that show up on the PE exam that are related to this, but we just didn't uh, get time. And there's six lectures that are on this topic. Okay, they're not as long as the other ones. I think we have, you know, 30 minutes, 30 minutes, 34, 45, and then uh, 16 minutes for the last um, two. So those lectures are up here. Then these are uh, this semester's uh, lectures. So by all means, um, feel free to use those resources. We have a, a one final design review that's scheduled um, for next Wednesday. And then the following Monday would be when we would uh, give the, the last test, when I would give the last test. And the last test will probably be a similar format. I'll give you uh, plenty of time to complete it. Um, and it'll, I'll try to incorporate design, some design concepts um, for us, for you, that will um, have Um, you know enough of design content for you that I uh, will will cover what we've uh, talked about. So, um, are you guys still seeing okay? Is is it is it buffering okay? So I got a warning here that says some users will experience some buffering. 
<clears throat> so if you can, if you don't mind, just you know, go to the chat and let me know if you got high enough quality video here. So my stream shows that I've dropped a couple of frames, but a pretty low percentage, and that we're able to stream about 60 frames per second. So it looks like it's been, a bit okay. Okay, thanks, Michael. All right, so we'll just keep on going on. So really, we only have, after today's lecture, um, uh, two more lectures on power screws and preloaded fasteners. Um, power screws are what you see for car jacks and stuff like that, and then fasteners are... Um, I think it's just more in interesting that you kind of understand the standards and how to kind of find the stresses in the fasteners. The preloaded fasteners is an important topic because it has to do with um, fatigue um, and how we ap apply preloads to uh, systems. Okay. All right, so I don't see any questions on the chat, so we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Um, so today my goal is really to just try to introduce you to the grammar of uh, bearings, primarily rolling uh, element bearings, which are comprised of ball bearings and roller bearings, and <clears throat> get help you to where you can kind of uh, see how to navigate the bearing manufacturer data and get those. Um, as mechanical engineers that are in your third and fourth year, you're likely very familiar with, you know, bearings. Um, bearings have been moved, used to move heavy objects since, you know, people uh, <laughs> had to move heavy objects going back all the way to, you know, Egyptian times and moving large structures on logs. Uh, it's very similar to a, a needle bearing today, same concept. Um, when we talk about rolling element bearings, we're talking about uh, the the metal that rolls, and it is the rolling element. And that rolling element can either be a ball, as a ball bearing, or a roller, as a roller bearing, or a needle bearing, or a tapered bearing, or a spherical bearing. Advances in materials and designs um, from uh, industrial and military demands have significantly advanced and standardized many of the bearing designs. In fact, there's the Anti-Friction Bearing Manufacturers Association, the AFBMA, and they have uh, standardized many of the bearing designs. So even though, you know, some of these designs are were originally patented by, you know, uh, Timken, for example, um, uh, many of the designs have been standardized and many different bearing manufacturers can make many different standard bearing types. Um, in fact, metric bearings can be purchased uh, and found worldwide, even for machines that are, you know, 50 years old. Uh, you ought to still be able to find in a standard bearing, standard metric bearing worldwide that'll, that'll fit that, that uh, application. Most of the materials are a hardened steel or a steel alloy. Um, for ball bearings, it's usually uh, 5210. Uh, steel and they're either case hardened or through hardened um, to about 61 to 65 uh, HRC. Uh, most roller bearings are made from case hardened steel alloys, which are 3310, 4620, and 8620. Um, the uh, AFBMA, the Anti Friction Bearing Manufacturing Associations, Association, or and or the ISO have standardized the bearing designs so that different manufacturers uh, can make bearings that are interchangeable. And the beauty of this is is that uh, you have an industry or you have a you know mechanical component um, that you know has been standardized which means that even if a company goes out of business or stops making it there's other companies that can still uh, manufacture that standing standard bearing. Uh, bearings are uh, classified according to their precision or their tolerances. Okay, in the U.S., uh, we have the ANSI standard, and that goes from ABEC 1 to 9, and where higher numbers are related to higher precision, so an ABEC 9 would be a, like a, a more expensive, more precise bearing. 
Um, and then we have the ISO classes, which is class six to two, where the higher precision is associated with a lower number class. So if you have a class two bearing, but it's an ISO bearing, that's a precise bearing. If you have a class nine bearing, which is an ANSI bearing, that's a precise, uh, well, a precision bearing. <clears throat> so uh, it's important to just kind of remember, you know, the class numbers are uh, inversely related to one another versus the ABAC classification and the ISO classification. Okay, uh, more precise bearings have better uh, surface tolerances and uh, should last longer. Um, and they are more expensive. Now we talked last time and we mentioned that we have um, uh, sliding bearings, okay, any surface that slides on another surface we could call a bearing surface. We also learned that one of the components is usually much harder than the other components and the softer of the component is uh, is usually uh, called the bearing a surface and it's uh, because of, uh, of friction and use, they're, they're expected to wear out uh, eventually, okay? So if we want to compare uh, rolling element bearings um, over sliding contact bearings, okay, then these are the differences, and this comes from Hamrock. And Hamrock actually uh, co-authored a book uh, with Steve Schmid, uh, which is a very similar book to this Norton book. Um, <clears throat> and it's uh, called Design of Machine Elements. And that book probably has the most uh, up-to-date and extensive uh, machine design information on bearings, much more than we cover uh, in this book or in this class. Okay, It's uh, also the same book that's listed in the syllabus as a recommended reading. And um, so going from where we talk about in these two lectures, you could go to the this book, uh, which is actually co-authored by Hamrock himself. <clears throat> okay. Um, so the, the following advantages of rolling, okay, rolling element bearings, okay, that would be the ball and needle bearings over sliding contact bearings, is that for with rolling bearings, we have low starting and operating friction, okay, on the order of 0.001 to 0.005. They can support both radial and thrust loads. They're less sensitive to interruptions in lubrication. Uh, there's no self-excited instabilities. They're good low temperature starting. They can seal the lubricant within the bearing for a lifetime lubricant. And they typically require less space in the axial direction. The following disadvantages of rolling bearings compared to hydrodynamic conformal sliding bearings okay, are that roller bearings may eventually fail from fatigue. They require more space in the radial di direction. They have poor damping quality. Uh, they have a higher noise level, and they have uh, <clears throat> they have more severe alignment requirements. Okay, uh, and they cost more. So this is sort of like a higher level comparison between uh, your rolling element element bearings and your sliding bearings and your rolling er element bearings and uh, hydrodynamic or conformal sliding bearings. <clears throat> now we didn't go over that section in detail in this class for the conformal contact. That's if you have a cam follower or uh, the gear teeth. Um, and but you can also use the information from uh, the chapter to uh, understand the, the lubrication requirements and bearing performance uh, for cams as well. Um, <clears throat> These are the different types of roller uh, rolling element bearings. Um, they can be ball bearings. This is the left column here. These are ball bearings. Uh, this is a deeper groove or Conrad bearing. It's a pretty common bearing. I think it's the most common bearing. Uh, and then you have angular contact bearings as well, where um, this you see there's a groove on each side that houses the bearing. The bearing uh, terminology is that we have an outer ring. That's this guy here, the outer ring. We have the balls themselves. That's the rolling elements. Okay. We have some sort of retainer and that's to keep the balls separated from one another. And then we have the inner ring. And uh, ball bearings uh, are good uh, for higher speed applications, uh, radial loads. 
Uh, roller bearings are preferred for heavier loads, and these are all these are the roller bearings here. Um, tapered roller bearings can handle both radial and thrust loads at moderate speeds. Okay, so over here, this is a tapered roller bearing, and you can see how these are tapered rollers. And this is the type of bearing that you'll see like in a wheel hub, you know, on an automobile, so that when you corner, you have cornering forces, those cornering forces, uh, when you're driving, are transmitted through the axle, and they're picked up through the bearing. And the bearing here, um, by its shape, is designed to... Uh, tolerate those thrust loads and the thrust loads are the loads that are classified as those coming here uh, through the center of the bearing axis okay those are the side loads and then the radial loads are the ones that are obviously coming here uh, in the radial direction from the center of the bearing um, deep groove ball bearings are better for heavier heavy thrust loads and radial loads at higher speeds so if you have high speed high thrust load you'd want a deeper groove ball bearing uh, this bearing here, this is an angular contact ball bearing. It only has uh, a retaining lip on one side, okay, so you don't see it on both sides. Okay, these are spherical roller bearings. They can take higher loads, okay, and here they're designed opposite, so they can take thrust in both directions uh, in this case. Uh, these are cylindrical bearings so that you have more uh, bearing surface. And the main difference to note, too, is that when you have a ball rolling on a surface, you actually have a point contact, okay? So a point contact is because, you know, you have a ball that's rolling on a plane, so you have a point contact. And then here where you have these uh, uh, ro roller bearings, <clears throat> which can be, you know, rollers that are like shaped like uh, part of a sphere or a cylinder or a needle, those are all rolling or a taper, these are all rolling element bearings, um, and they can uh, take a uh, little bit higher loads, uh, but they're not as high as speed, and they have hot, slightly more friction. Okay, so if you look here, you see down here we have line contact, and that line contact means that those Hertzian stresses, those contact stresses, are distributed along that line of contact. Over here with the ball bearing, those Hertzian contact stresses are distributed at that point. Okay. Uh, over here we have uh, a needle bearing. It's a type of roller uh, bearing, and it has these low-profile needles. And so these are useful where you have compact uh, bearing spaces and certain uh, load requirements. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's you know designs where uh, more than one different bearing will certainly satisfy the design requirements. Um, and then it's kind of a trade-off between friction and and cost and and noise and you know, uncertainty in the design and, and whatnot. Uh, over here, these are also, these are thrust bearings as well. These are pure thrust, okay? This is a tapered roller bearing. It takes thrust uh, and um, radial loads. Uh, these are for pure thrust loads, okay? So you'd have your uh, shaft or your weight would be um, uh, on this uh, inner ring. You'd have your retainer here and your outer ring, and this allows the relative motion between each other. Okay, these are roller thrust bearings, and these are ball thrust bearings. And on this table over here, we see that there's different coefficient of frictions uh, associated with the different bearing type. Okay, so the lowest coefficient of friction is this ball bearing self-aligning type. That's one of the most common uh, bearings used. It's good for higher speeds and radial loads in general. And then you go up in friction from your radial ball thrust, ball deep groove, roller spherical, roller tapered, and roller needle has the highest mm -hmm. coefficient of friction. It's about five times greater than the ball. So this, this design here would be about five times greater than the friction that you would uh, experience in a bearing of this type. Okay, so this covers most uh, bearing types that you would see and like you know mentioned earlier they're standardized uh, so that different manufacturers will make uh, different types of bearings. Now bearings can be even further classified <coughs> based on their load and how they are oriented and whether you have single row, double row, duplex, uh, etc. And these are some of the different uh, designs that you're capable of and obviously uh, you would get to a double row or a double bearing uh, in situations where you'd have higher loads. 
over here these are thrust bearings and in this case this is spinning in this direction okay here okay and over here these are spinning around the outside direction okay so these are your radial and thrust bearings uh, for the ball bearings you see all these are balls and you'll see these often in your you know mechanical designs you'll see these as the cross section this is what they look like and you have a similar classification for your roller radial uh, thrust bearings and then your roller thrust bearings here <clears throat> okay these are your radial bearings okay here and you see you have single row double row spherical contact etc and then these are your thrust bearings and you can see that really you know you what you're looking at is the classification of the shape of the actual ball and the main difference is the contact <clears throat> area between a point and a line and these are generally higher speed lower loads these are generally lower speeds higher loads um, and these are <clears throat> a little noisier okay but these are just in general okay so uh, when we talk about bearings this is a, a graph uh, from one of the manufacturers this is the relative performance size and availability for ball bearings um, and different bearings can tolerate some uh, various levels of uh, misalignment and that's given here this is this permissible misalignment uh, so this looks like it's a uh, 0.8 degrees uh, radial 0.12 degrees clearance. I think this is 0 0.3 degrees. I'm not sure exactly uh, how this, what this space is indicating. And in here, I think that's a decimal place. <clears throat> or maybe it's 0 degrees at 3 inches of the bearing, or something like that. Um, the limiting speed is relative to the Conrad type bearing. This is the Conrad type. This is the most popular type. Um, and uh, so like a speed rate rating of, of like 0.7 means that for a bearing of, of this type, if you went to a bearing of this type, you can only go at 70% of the speed. Um, and then the design also shows you uh, how good it does in radial loading and thrust loading. Okay, so this is your capacity for radial loads and thrust loads. So, for example, Conrad type is good in radial loads and it's fair in thrust loads and you can kind of pick that out just by looking at it. Um, over here where you have this opening here for this, this type, um, this is the maximum type. It's excellent in radial loads. It's poor in thrust loads. And then here you have this angular contact bearing and it's good in both radial and thrust loads. Okay, and so this is kind of how we go through through there. If you don't have a self-aligning bearing, then you have to put a little bit more effort into mm -hmm. making sure that the tolerance stack up of the machine allows the bearings to uh, uh, be located precisely. If you have misalignment, then you introduce residual stress. If you have residual stresses, um, then you have a non-zero mean stress that shows up in that bearing. Uh, which uh, great, can greatly reduce <coughs> the fatigue life. Okay, um, this is the same uh, graph except for uh, talking about the roller bearings and the differences in the different designs. Okay, and so you can use this kind of as a starting point uh, if you know you have certain types of loads and you know um, you have uh, <coughs> some speed requirements. You can kind of bend. Uh, compare the baseline speed to this Con Conrad type, okay? And you can see, uh, <clears throat> you know, what what the bearing is good for. Obviously, these are thrust bearings, so they, you would expect them to be very uh, excellent in, in thrust. Um, this one's very poor in uh, radial loading, okay? And these X's here are the options. Okay, so if you can get them shields or seals or snap rings, metric or inch, and you can see that um, all these are available in metric, and not all of them are available in inches from this uh, manufacturer. Okay, if you want to find bearings, <coughs> you can find them from uh, all sorts of suppliers, common bearing manufacturers, Timken, HK, uh, SKF, Koyo, uh, Moog, and then you can uh, buy your standard bearings from you know bearing manufacturers. If you go to 
for example, like master, and you just type bearings, you get all sorts of bearings. These are power transmission bearings. <clears throat> if you go to your ball bearings, they're further classified to light duty, heavy duty. You want to pick your shaft diameter and you get your metric and your uh, US units. Then you have flange bearings, all sorts of different uh, bearings for different applications. Okay, so these are your ball bearings. And then you can go over here to your rolling element bearings. These are your needle bearings, tapered roller, combo roller, one way lock, <clears throat> okay, needle thrust. So, uh, as you can see, there's a, a lot of different options for you. Um, you can actually also go and look at the different uh, suppliers for bearings. So you go to Timken, Timken has their bearings <clears throat> listed. You could, they're uh, here and they have all their different types of bearings and they even make custom or specialty bearings for people at Timken Research uh, located in uh, Canton, Ohio. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, if you wanted, uh, um, replacement bearings you may be able to get them quickly from McMaster MSC if you want some little tiny bearings uh, from you can get them from Sumi for tiny machines and then you know Granger motion control and, and many other ones okay when we talk about bearings uh, we have to know what their life is okay and their life is uh, rated in uh, revolutions or hours at, at a certain speed which is you know revolutions um, but if you have clean lubricant provided, uh, then they should fail by fatigue, by surface fatigue. Okay, and failure is defined by the first pitting in either the ball or the raceway. Usually the raceways will fail first, and you can hear when a bearing is going out. It's a terrible sound. You know, it's, uh, you know, probably if, you, if you're like me and you didn't grow up with an awful lot of money, you had an old car and... Um, you know, found that you reach the life of the bearing. So bearings don't fail uniformly, okay? So they don't have like a uniform or normal distribution or Gaussian distribution, but they fail instead by what's called a libel distribution, uh, which means it's a little bit skewed. <clears throat> and that's kind of expressed here in this life curve, okay? And um, like I said, bearings are rated in terms of revolutions or hours at their design speed. Uh, this, the life rating is the rating where 90% of the bearings survived, okay? So if you look at the life rating for bearings, what they're saying is like, hey, this is where nine out of 10 of the bearings will, they, they'll make it to this many revolutions. That means 10% failed, okay? So that, that point or that life is called the L10 life of the bearing. And so you'll, you'll be able to find that for most bearing designs. That's the base bearing design. So if you pick that number for that number of revolutions, uh, then you'll know that, well, 90% of the bearings made it to that life. But you should expect that this component, you know, will eventually fail. The L10 life is used to select bearings uh, for the given load. So we also need to... Um, <clears throat> find out what the load is. So we do that like this. If we want to know what the life is for other um, percentages, like if we wanted to know if 99% of the bearings would uh, fail, then we need to take that L10 value and multiply it by this uh, coefficient here. And that corresponds to the probability of failure. So if we take the L10 life, multiply it by 0.21, KR equal 0.21, then we know that 99 out of 100 of the bearings will last that many life cycle. <clears throat> the L10 life is given in terms of load and the basic, basic dynamic load rating, uh, which is this uh, variable C. So the load, this P usually comes from your design and the C comes from the bearing manufacturers, man, ban, bearing manufacturers data. So for ball bearings, <clears throat> the L10 life is this parameter from their chart divided by the load that you're going to give it to the cubed power. For roller bearings, the L10 life is the C that you would get from that particular bearing chart over the load uh, times 10 to the 3, you know, or 3.33. <clears throat> 
So if you combine these two, you basically take your LP life, you want to find it at any time, you take your L10 life as defined here for ball and roller bearings, then you get this expression for whatever probability you want. <coughs> you pick that prob the uh, reliability factor and then you multiply it by this parameter which you get from the bearing tables and then divide it by your load. So if you're given your load and you know what percentage of bearings you want to last uh, at, at that load, then that'll give you your, your life. So if your life is lower than you need it, then you need to find a bearing with a different C. Okay, and that's how, that's how that works. That's how we go through that design process. Okay, so this is uh, <clears throat> from one of the bearing manufacturers. And this gives you, this is where you find that C, that dynamic load rating. So you can see here, we start off at 1400 all the way down here. If we go to 6330, we get 49,000. <clears> okay, <throat> so it's quite a difference, quite a range in C. So if you're given your P, you can uh, divide that by your C to the right power to get your bearing life. Now, since the L10 life, um, has come out, the ASME has modified that for a little bit more complicated model. And you can take the L10 life and multiply it by this ASL number. And this is something that we don't cover in this class, but you should know that it exists. And if you want to use the latest American Society for, for Mechanical Engineering uh, standard, you can go to their uh, reference material. I think they actually have a calculator that you can use. And you can plug in your values for your design, come up with this ASL number and then multiply it by your nominal L10 life to get a corrected uh, lifetime <clears throat> that's backed by the ASME. This C0 load here is another load that you have to concern yourself with and that's the static load rating. And this load rating is for this, for this bearing ser series here. That means that you can go up to this load without uh, 0 0.0001 times the diameter uh, of permanent uh, deformation. Okay, so but if you exceed this load, you're going to introduce 0 0.0001 times the diameter of permanent deformation in the raceway. So you're going to dent the you're going to dent the the raceway here uh, on the inner race or the outer race, and you're going to cause a permanent deformation so that every time the bearing rolls over that little divot uh, it's going to cause noise <coughs> and cause other problems okay so this is how we pick them okay obviously these greater loads are with larger diameter bearings and so if you find that you have a, a load from a given design um, but that load doesn't give you the life that you expect then you may have to pick a bigger shaft that can accommodate a bigger bearing or um, just change your design a little bit to redistribute the loads. All right, so this is how we use it. <clears throat> this is uh, an example from a problem that was done in chapter 10, chapter 11. Um, and we're told that we have uh, transverse loads here that's, that's through these reaction loads, R, R1Y, R2Y. Obviously, this is gonna make it from the shaft uh, through the bearings into the structure, okay? And we're told that uh, <clears throat> transverse loads are 16 pounds at R1. So there's 16 pounds here in transverse load. And then there's 54 pounds over here. Uh, since the load at R2 is four times that as R1, one design can be created for R2 and also used for R1. Okay. So instead of starting with the weaker bearing, we can design, I'm sorry, the, the smaller load, we can design for the heavier load and then just use that same bearing on the other side. <clears throat> okay, and the cost difference shouldn't be so much that using the, an over-designed bearing is gonna be the end of the world. Uh, shaft diameter is the same as 0.591 uh, uh, for both of them um, based upon choice, tentative choice, which means we have to may have to iterate on the design of a 15 millimeter uh, inner diameter bearing, okay? Shaft speed is 1,725 RPM. Thrust loads are negligible, so that means we can just use a radial bearing. And a 5% failure rate is desired, so if we go back to that R value, that means we want this value right here. 
where we want 95% of the bearings to survive. So that means this KR is going to be 0.62. So what we can do is go into our L10 life uh, factor. Um, and then we go and we got to pick a bearing here, F C, that'll, that'll uh, take some of the load. <clears throat> in this case, uh, and there was some iteration in here, but uh, we ended up choosing, or you know, in this example, ended up choosing a 6302. Okay, it has this 15, uh, 15 millimeter inside diameter, 6302 bearing. So if we go over here, we can look at the limiting speed is 18,000. Well, it's greater than 17,025, so we're okay. Uh, the dynamic load is 1930, so we're going to use that here 1930 and divided by 54 and cube it to find our life cycle okay so we see we have 45 times 10 to the 9 revolutions and if we want to get our lp value which is at a 95 percent reliability we multiply it by the reliability factor of 0.62 and we come up with 27.9 27.9 times 10 to the 9 uh, revolutions okay <clears throat> and so um if we uh, look at the smaller bearing, it's going to have a smaller uh, load, okay? And the smaller bearing reaction load is 16 pounds here, and we see that the L10 life is 1.75 times 10 to the 12 versus times 10 to the 9, and we see that there's a nonlinear relationship between the two, uh, between load and life. <clears throat> now, if we multiply it by the uh, uh, life um, probability factor 0.62 we get 1.09 times 10 to the 12 revolutions so we get the life for both the bearings and that, that can kind of tell us based upon <clears throat> you know speed or how long this is in service how long we can expect those bearings to last and it can kind of inform you know a maintenance routine or checking your schedule or we can at least expect or give some you know confidence to the user that if they buy that product this is how long it'll last so three and a half reduction in load results in a 38 increase in fatigue life that's shown here. Okay, so if you have if you can reduce the loads or support them in different ways, then you can get significantly higher fatigue life. 38 times the fatigue life just with the three and a half reduction in load. Okay, <clears throat> and then we find that the limiting speed is 1800. So that's kind of a you know this is how we go through this to uh, quickly get to a bearing that we think uh, will work. All right, now. What do we do when we have both radial and thrust loads? Well, this comes from the Anti-Friction Bearing Manufacturers Association, and they give you this table here, which uh, walks you through what to do um, if you have bearings. And so they give you these five steps, or these five uh, notes. And what we do is we have this equation to calculate P uh, using these new f uh, factors, X, V, the radial load, Y, and the axial load. Um, and this V is a rotation factor here, the X is a radial factor, and the Y is a thrust factor, okay? If the uh, thrust load, the axial, the thrust load here over V times FR is less than or equal to EPS, this little E, then we set X to 1 and Y to 0. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that the thrust load is... Um, not as big of a deal and we can uh, accommodate for um, the uh, little bit of effect of the thrust load here uh, in this first parameter. Okay, we have the same equations that we had earlier for the life uh, at a given reliability which is the C over P and this is the P here that we're calculating in this equation if we have some thrust uh, load in addition to a radial load for both ball and roller bearings. Okay, so uh, we'll come back, we'll show a little bit of example, but the calculation process is pretty straightforward. Usually we'll know the radial and thrust loads, so if we know those loads, they kind of have dictated the shaft size, and then we find the bearing that will fit the shaft, and then from that bearing, we look up the dynamic load, C factor, the static load, C naught, and then the uh, V, X, and Y parameters to get the effective load uh, P and the life. Or uh, we can solve for the dynamic load factor C uh, using 
V, X, and Y based on the bearing type and load and desired life, <clears throat> and then we can uh, uh, solve for the desired life <clears throat> or solve for the dynamic factor C. Uh, we always have to check the static load. Okay, don't forget about that. Make sure the static load um, the static load is less than the static load factor so that we don't deform uh, the, the, the raceway and the bearing. Okay, and these are just the, the equations that we use putting it all together in terms of uh, radial and thrust loads as well. So let's do an example. <clears throat> um, so problem here is we need to pick a bearing and we know that we want a deep groove ball bearing. Uh, that will give us some thrust load resistance and this is for specific loading and desired life. Uh, we've looked at the design and we looked at how the forces pass through the system and we found that we have a radial load of uh, 1,686 pounds and an axial load of about 1,000 pounds and a shaft speed of about 2,000 RPM. We're going to say, hey, uh, we're going to go ahead and use <clears throat> a, uh, a thrust bearing, um, a Conrad, I mean, sorry, a Conrad type uh, ball bearing and we're going to assume that the inner ring rotates and a suitable size bearing to give a life of 5 times 10 to the 8 res revolutions. Okay, so <clears throat> what we do is we pick a bearing, a 6316 uh, from the table. And this is from the bottom of the table. It's one of the larger bearings here. Um, and we get the data that the C, the dynamic load factor, is 21,200 and the static load factor is 18,000 pounds and the max RPM is 3,800 RPMs. So that will satisfy the 2,000 RPM requirement. And then we go <clears throat> and try to get our uh, X and our V and X and Y uh, parameters from the table. Okay, so we calculate the um, F over FA over C naught, that's the axial load over the, the um, uh, C naught, which is the static load, and this value is 0.056 from the table. Okay, C over FA is uh, 0.056, so it's down here. And then if we look all the way across the table over here, we see that this E, this is an E, you can't see it too well on the slide, but you can see it a little bit easier in the book, it's 0.26. Okay, and then what we do is we have these different cases of these parameters and their relationships to E. Okay, so we have a single row bearing, so we'll have this, this case here, and we need to see um, if it's greater than um, E. So we'll, we'll come here and look and see, and we look at the FA, which is this load here, over V times uh, FR. Um, and we calculate that, it's about 0 0.6, 0 0.6, <clears throat> and that's greater than E, which is 0.26. So in that case, where F over V times FR is greater than E, we'll come down here uh, to that table. Um, and uh, V is 1 because it's rotating, okay? So in relation to the load, the inner ring is rotating. Okay, so the inner ring is rotating along about a shaft. This says said here the inner ring rotates. That means V is 1. Okay, otherwise it would have been 1.2 if it was stationary and the outer ring was rotating. So it says V is 1, okay, because the inner ring is rotating. And then the next step is <coughs> um, since the ratio in step 3 is greater than E, we can extract the X and Y factors uh, from x is uh, 0.56, okay? So this is x here is 0.56. Uh, y is <clears throat> 1.71 it's a single row bearing. x is 0.56, y is uh, 1.71. And then we can use that to calculate our load um, so our load P is X which is 0.56 times V which is 1 because the inner ring is rotating times the radial load plus Y which is 1.71 times the thrust load which is a thousand pounds and we get an overall load here that is 2,000 
675 pounds. And that's the load that we put into this life equation here. Um, <clears throat> and so when we put the load in here and we picked a C, and that C is this dynamic load rating, this 21,200, we put it in here. Divide them and cube it. <clears throat> we find that the L10 life is uh, 5 times 10 to the 2 million revolutions or 5 times 10 to the 8 revolutions, and that meets our life cycle. Uh, the note here is this is the result actually required some iteration, trying several bearing numbers before finding that this one would give the desired life. Okay, so this kind of shows the design process after we picked the right one, and this is all stuff you could probably get <coughs> some support in software. But this is kind of where we start, okay, so if we have a combined radial and thrust load. When we talk about uh, bearings, we also have to worry about how we're going to mount them. And so what's typically done is uh, we'll have machined reliefs or shoulders and shafts uh, where the bearing will rest against in a matching <coughs> relief uh, in the housing, okay? And uh, the bearing will be put in. Often bearings are, I mean, the bearings themselves are designed so that they can be press fit. Um, but if you have to press fit a bearing on a shaft and then press fit that shaft into a housing, um, it actually can be pretty difficult to for, us, for assembling everything. And so often we have different forms of assembly where we have, um, say, like a threaded portion of the shaft with a nut and uh, a lock washer um, that we can smash into there and, and, and retain. Um, and uh, this is one way of having it where you don't have to have a press fit. This is another way where you have a spacer that spacer that would go uh, around the shaft, the length of the shaft. <clears throat> and then you'd have uh, some uh, retainer here where you could bolt it in and it would, it would touch off the top portion of the bearing uh, here on the housing. Um, and then on the shaft, you have a shoulder to locate those two features here and then you'd put a spacer on. This would go uh, around the shaft and you would retain that on the other side. Uh, other ways are to use a snap ring uh, here. So you'd put the, the bearing in here. You could put some rings, um, some features to, to locate the bearing. And then you can use a snap ring with a groove on the shaft to uh, retain uh, the bearing on the shaft. <clears throat> so when you go to a bearing manufacturer, they have other hardware that they want to sell you to uh, install their bearing and you can look at their uh, application notes and all the auxiliary hardware and different ways of installing them uh, for your application. <clears throat> so uh, do we have any questions so far? I'll just give you a second here to see if you have any questions. So if, if, you, if you have a question, just type it in, and I'll try to monitor that. Okay. Another thing that we have to consider is thermal stresses, okay? So when things get hot, they thermally grow. Uh, it's at L times alpha delta T, uh, <clears throat> and you get thermal growth. Um, any piece of metal that gets hot will grow. Um, and if you have a shaft that is constrained on both ends, fully constrained on both ends, that when that shaft heats up, uh, which it will because all, all bearings have some friction, and kind of if they're spending a couple thousand RPM, you're going you're gonna to heat up a little bit, and that heat's going to be transmitted through the shaft, that shaft's going to grow, um, or just the differences in the ambient temperature is going to cause the shaft to grow. And it's important that the shaft is allowed to grow because if you don't allow it to grow, then you introduce residual stresses. And residual stresses uh, cause non-zero mean stresses, and non-zero mean stresses uh, can be very undesirable for uh, re uh, reducing fatigue life. Okay, so we don't, we don't want to introduce uh, residual stresses in general in a, in a design. And it can also cause misalignment and severely limit the life of your, 
your design. So one of the strategies to do that is to have a fixed floating uh, design for shafts where you'd have your uh, bearing fixed. You'd retain it here. This is with a nut and a lock ring. And it's mated against the shaft on this end. And on this end, it's actually free. Um, it's a floating bearing where it's not uh, locked in. We have your retainers here, but it's allowed, the shaft itself is allowed to move back and forth. Uh, this is a gasket that uh, here along the shaft, and the shaft can have some relative motion on this side, um, which allows the, uh, <coughs> the assembly to thermally grow and shrink without uh, having residual stresses. There are other types of bearings, such as these pillow block bearings uh, here, which are already contained and ready to be mounted, and you can just uh, put them in your machines. These show up all over machines uh, for transmitting, you know, shaft loads through machines. You have these uh, cam yoke type followers where the bearings are inside. They can be ball or needle bearings, and then you have <coughs> uh, like a stud uh, base. So these you can add to different machines, and then you can use this bearing surface for a cam. Uh, for a system cam follower type. Uh, and then you have these spherical bearings up here. These are female threaded, uh, female threaded rod bearings, so you can screw them onto things so you can allow for relative motion. Um, and this is the male threaded one. And then this is a linear bearing. So this would go over a shaft, and then you would uh, fix your machine or your component to the shaft. And then uh, <clears throat> as you move that shaft, these bearings actually roll in a linear fashion through these guides. And then this is a linear ball bearing uh, surface. And there's different, there's many, many different, this is certainly not exhaustive. There's plenty of uh, specialty mm -hmm. bearings that you can <clears throat> find for an application. Uh, more recently, um, polymer bearings have come a long way in their design. And this is the homepage of IGUS uh, bearings and they have these long lasting self lubricating plastics. And they have this specially designed dry lin and they have the Igu ball, they have the uh, Zeros and iGlide. These are sort of like plane bearings. Okay, we also call them bushings when they go all the way around a shaft. And these are polymer bearings. <clears throat> they have really low friction. They don't need. They're self-lubricating. Um, and <clears throat> uh, these are becoming more and more popular. Um, and they have really high performance. They're certainly not cheap. Um, one of the applications that IGUS has, this is one of their dry lin projects products, is this uh, linear bearing here where you'd uh, place this, their, one of their specialty materials with the dry lin and it would go over uh, their uh, rail system, their ground rail, and then you could have a linear carriage uh, style that would uh, go uh, in that linear direction. So there's Really an awful lot of uh, things to choose. These are just some pictures from McMaster. Uh, these are power transmission bearings. You'll uh, notice some of the um, <coughs> uh, similar images that we saw earlier. Okay, and this is what we covered in the first lecture was plane bearings. Okay, um, and these are your roller bearings. If you click on any one of these, you're going to get uh, you know even more options. <coughs> so there's definitely a wide range of uh, components that you can choose to have relative motion, relative velocity between components. Okay, so uh, that is the end of the uh, chapter on bearings and uh, a basic summary and uh, guide on how to get started to pick them and get your uh, life calculations. You essentially are going to start with your load and then you're going to uh, try to find a bearing that will fit on your shaft that will meet that static and dynamic uh, load requirement and give you the life that you uh, need. And that life is usually uh, <clears throat> reported in hours at a design speed or in revolutions. So um, we will stop there and I will be happy to answer any questions. So the question is, <clears throat> when is the final design package due? Um, uh, that's on the 14th.
Okay, so that's 12 days from today. So I don't see any other questions. Yep, you're welcome. <clears throat> <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and uh, end this stream. And uh, if you have any questions, please email me uh, or let me know. Um, I know this has been a long semester. Uh, we only have uh, two more lectures, uh, lecture content material, and then we have uh, our last design review where we can kind of log on one last time there's a few teams left we'll see where their final design is um, and then <clears throat> we have uh, the take-home test I'm going to try to get the test home earlier than the 14th um, hopefully I'll get it out by that that date just to give you a little bit more time I uh, hope you guys appreciate more time I hope it doesn't give you more time to you know necessarily uh, um, get unauthorized assistance from your peers, but that it gives you a little bit more time to think about the problems, get it, get it all there. Now, remember all the previous homework, which is going to be um, from you know chapters 11 and 15, is going to be due on Wednesday, next Wednesday as well. So go ahead and get a start on that. I know <clears throat> we were supposed to go over the power screws and fasteners here. I'll try to upload these two lectures. Um, um, by next Monday so that you can have them and watch them uh, whenever you want and it'll help you to get the uh, homework done all right <clears throat> so uh, yeah if you have any questions uh, let me know uh, otherwise I will uh, talk to you guys soon thanks <clears throat>